Now, in today's interview, we feature a coach that lives in the UK. His name is Joe Dixon. And what I'm going to do is below this video, I'm going to link over to all of his social media and his business so you can kind of follow him there uh, and connect with him if you want. And Joe is a private soccer trainer that lives in the UK. And he's being interviewed by Leonardo Caparelli. I've worked with Leo for the past uh, four years now at this point. Leo also lives in the UK, and Leo deals with a lot of the coaches that live over in the UK that have successful businesses, and this is a great interview. I highly recommend this, whether you're in soccer or basketball or really any other sport, this is a very high quality interview. I watched it at this point uh, two times, and I really recommend watching this all the way through. If you're thinking about starting a training business in the UK, Take me up on this, all right? There's a link right below the video, and that's gonna set you up with a call uh, with Leo. Leo would love to chat with you if you're thinking about starting a soccer training business in the UK. Um, I deal with everyone that lives in the US, and anyone who lives in the UK uh, will go through Leo. So if you wanna set up a chat with him, it's a free call. All you need to do is tap the link right below in the description to set that up. Go ahead, enjoy this interview. Um, I know you will, and I think you're gonna get a lot out of it. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon. All content's good content. All good, yeah. No worries, <laughs> okay. mate. The better, the better, the better. The, yeah, the more exactly. you have, the better. Cool. All right, so Joe, uh, so tell us tell us about how, how you started your coaching journey and how you got into business. Um, I would say, I would say um, I've always had a playing background in sport. I've always played sports. Um, and you know, I always wanted to seek that. I think the only thing that I knew growing up was playing football, playing sports. Um, and um, that led to me playing for clubs. Uh, and then obviously, I had a I had an injury when I was younger, which kind of made me, made me question what I wanted to do apart from playing. Um, and that's why I went into coaching. It's funny because I actually did an engineering course, mm-hmm. uh, and then I changed to sports. And then that's when I discovered my love for coaching. Um, I've coached at various academies, Bradford City, uh, Sheffield United. But I think because I I started so young, I kind of felt, and and because of my playing commitments, I played quite a high level here in England, um, which meant kind of like um, restricted to what I could do with my free time. Um, And I wanted to go, I wanted to explore the world, which meant I actually went over to Canada. So I lived in Canada for about a year. um, And I was playing over there. I was coaching over there. And that's where the idea came from there was a real gap for additional training Mm -hmm. Um, where could players go and receive extra training without any commitment, playing commitments or contracts. Um, And that's kind of where we, that's where where the idea came from doing one-to-ones. Aside if it's just a bit of a money side hustle kind of thing, just, you know, a bit of free time, just helped a couple of players out, um, you know, a bit of money on the side to pay for maybe my petrol for the week or, you know, to go out for a meal. That was kind of like the mindset thing that I had then. Um, but over in Canada, because I was an English guy and because of my background in the game, they kind of like snapped my hands off it. Um, and, you know, we were, I was getting clients all the time and I really liked it because you had that personal interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to know the player. You, you really build that um, relationship with them that you really want to tell them. Um, and then after a year, my visa ran out, so I came back over here to England, um, and I carried on playing over here. Um, and my playing background is because I'm hard of hearing, so I'm actually deaf in one ear. So I play for I play international football, so I play for England and Great Britain deaf men's teams, which means I'm, I'm away a lot. I try in St George's Park, you know. I have, so I've got a bit of a profile about me. Um, and I came back here, and then the pandemic happened. Um, the pandemic happened and um, I, ha- I had a job, but obviously we were um, furloughed. And then the, I remember the restrictions saying that you could still do one-to-ones. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what, let's just try it here. So I made a post, I posted it on Facebook. I was like, um, does anyone want to one-to-ones in a field with um, a you know level two coach, playing experience, England, GB? And... You know, I got a lot of requests and, you know, it just started off from doing five or six clients in a field. Um, and then it went to, and then I was fully booked out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that's when it started becoming the business sense. It was like, how can I make more money from this? Now, this is actually getting serious. Like, people actually want me. I'm in demand. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I start and um, YouTube, you know, watching videos. I, it's funny because I actually looked on the your YouTube channel, and I could see I watched a few of your videos before because it's a previously watched, previously watched. So yeah, I yeah. watched your videos, you know, two, three years ago when the pandemic happened. Yeah. Um, so passive income was starting to come into play. I knew a couple of coaches because of my background and they were again on furlough as well. Mm -hmm. So I brought them on board and then I joined the pandemic. We had, I had this field near me and that we were doing like 30, 40 sessions a day, mm -hmm. 40 players and there was like five coaches. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they loved what we did. Um, because it was intense, um, yeah. it was it was rep repetitive. And I think I, n I never really thought about it much then about what the future was because I just thought pandemic will end. I'll just go back to my job because I was coaching at Sheffield United. Um, but towards the end of the pandemic, I think parents and players started asking, "What are you doing when you know when we go back to normal? Like, what are your plans? You know, where can I still do training?" Um, and then that's when I started to think about. The business that's when i started to think about how can we make a model that could work mm -hmm. um and that kind of guess i guess that answers your question is that's where the company yp was founded and created as a brand yeah. and not only just represents me being a coach who also plays for england and great britain mm -hmm. but now when we post availabilities or about our programs it's mm -hmm. a brand People yeah. come to us wanting to be trained by YP mm -hmm. rather than coming to us to be trained by Joe Dixon yeah. or by a various coach. And that's that's where we are now, I guess. Awesome. That's really cool. So so tell us a bit about, so what, what do you guys specialise in? What type of training is it at the moment? Um, so again, going back to what I previously stated was there was no additional training for players. Mm -hmm. Um, and the biggest thing that we saw was it was technical training mm -hmm. for me where the game's going and where the game is now every player on the pitch has to be able to win a 1v1 every player needs to have the skill to beat players get out of tricky situations every player needs to have a good quality touch and be able to play the ball much faster because the game is so much quicker these days so our idea is technical training yeah. make players no matter what position they are be able to use both feet be able to be comfortable on the ball mm -hmm. be able to do things um, and that's why we've developed that really high emphasis of intensity, repetitive training, um, where players are getting thousands of touches on the ball. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of and it evolves around the identity of becoming the best version of yourself. So that mentality where you want to constantly get better every day mm -hmm. um, on and off the pitch. And that's how we've created that brand as well. Um, so to give you a couple of examples, we just run weekly sessions. Um, we have five phases. Mm -hmm. Phase one is pre-academy. So that's for mm -hmm. players under the age of eight. Just the fun fundamentals, you know, like a morning session, ball mastery, all that, loads of games. And then we have game development. That's from eight to 12. Those are just playing small-sided games, getting more comfortable within the game, how the game's played, you know, about defending, attacking, transitions, all that kind of stuff. And then phase three is our PDP. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where things start getting a bit more serious. This is player development programme. This is for players who are probably on the borderline of getting into academies, so small-sided groups. Um, really intense. So it's, it's only 12 players for two coaches. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like a lot of, of your own work, a lot of partner work, a lot of uh, 1v1s, 2v2s, a lot of re repetitions. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of success from that. I think we've had about, we've only been running it for two years. We've already had about 15 or 16 players signed for academies from that programme. Wow, um, so we're really proud of that but the emphasis of our program is really to make them a better player slash person you know taking accountability for their training taking accountability for their actions all that kind of stuff so that's where we've kind of developed like a, a more well-rounded uh, program that we're helping them with their education or whatever decisions they want to make and then phase four and five is just like the elite stuff so like one-to-ones Mm -hmm. um, match analysis, um, scholarship matches, training, all that kind of stuff. So we've kind of like really developed a whole curriculum. Yeah, yeah, love that. So how did how did you find, because with a lot of coaches we work with, uh, at the beginning they want to specialise in one one on one, so one yeah. one to one. Yeah, yeah. Now, a, a, an obstacle they, they come across is that 
if they want to scale their business mm. and doing one-to-ones, you can only do one-to-ones a certain amount of time during the week. Yeah. So how did, how did you find the transition from one-to-one into groups? What, was there a fear that if you were to go into groups, you would lose clients? Yeah. Or was it just a smooth? Um, I think we, I made the promise that the intensity will still be there. The repetitions will still be there. And I think doing small sided, small groups, sorry, 12 players and two coaches on a a quarter pitch, so a seven side, a five side slash seven side pitch, um, tells parents that they're the main focus, they're intense. A lot of the drills that we do, it's almost like as if when they're in pairs, I would be the coach and I would be the player on a one to one. But in a group session, it's two players. So they're taking the responsibility, they're taking the accountability. So one player would be the coach, they'll be the feeder, they'll be the pusher, they'll be the intensity person while the other player does it, and then they swap it in sets. Um, and that's how we've done it. So we've kind of like developed the model where players become coaches. Mm-hmm. They become the feeders, and that's how we can still emphasize that one-on-one kind of experience throughout those sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a fear about it, but I think because players kept asking us, parents kept asking us, they, it was kind of like the support was there. You know, they wanted to carry on with us. And so we started on sand base, cheaper, um, and at, you know, weird venues. Um, and then after six, seven months, we managed to move to 4G, more standard elite venues, pay a little bit more because parents were willing to pay more, expand on sessions. And I literally took, whenever a pitch came free, I took it. I didn't care what hour it was or what day of the week, I took it. Um, and I just made it work uh, for myself. Um, in terms of scaling it and with a team, I've had the same team since the start. Um, and I think they've kind of because I made it a brand rather than maybe calling it Joe Dixon's one to one, Joe Dixon's coaching. I made it a brand. They feel like they equally have a right to play in it rather than just supporting the main act. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why they've helped. They've brought into it, they run their own sessions now. I'm not at every session, I'm doing my own stuff. There's people doing their own things as well. Um, and again, it's just finding the right coach that you can trust. That's the hardest part. And training them right. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most difficult things that people find in scaling is trusting other coaches, but training them properly. Yeah, I com- completely agree with you. So this goes on to my, now you mentioned it briefly, but this goes on to my next question. So what, what has been the, the biggest obstacle you faced since starting your business? Um, the biggest obstacle because of our sessions we use a lot of equipment so poles cones uh, balls um, target nets small nets bazookas all that kind of stuff it's been transport equipment so I have a van Um, so that's been one of the biggest issues it's been accessibility to equipment everywhere but you know if you you know because we're based on one area in what venue it really helps um, I mean, that's been the biggest issue and the, the biggest challenge. Sorry. And then the other biggest challenge has been um, expanding now. Mm-hmm. There's, only a, there's only a certain amount of pitch space you can get. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it becomes a barrier, you know, you have to constantly buy new revenues. You know, you've got a waiting list. You have to, we have waiting lists of 100 players. Like we're, having to, we're trying to constantly keep, you know, making sure those players aren't waiting for long because if they're waiting for more than, I would say, two, three weeks, they go and find somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's always you know, trying to meet the demand. Um, but it's also making sure that it's accessible and affordable. You know, we don't want to be ripping people off. We don't want to be, you know, we want to make it accessible to as many people. Um, mm-hmm. And I think with the, the other challenges being the cost of pitches. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, to answer your question in terms, of if I was a one-to-one coach, how can I scale my business? What's the biggest challenge I face? It is finding a pitch where I can run one-to-ones. So yes. say, for example, a pitch costs between 14, uh, 14 six, 50 pounds for an hour. And you want to make money on that. As a one-to-one coach, you can't be charging 50 quid for a one-to-one. Like, very rare, very few people are going to pay that. 
Yeah. So it's making relationships, it's finding the right venues who are willing to, you know, who maybe see your long-term commitments and are willing to drop the prices and then finding the right pitch space so you can then get two or three sessions on. So then you can start talking about business model where every hour I'm making X and Y instead of, you know, breaking uh, bank, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and even money. So those are the, big, the biggest challenges, I would say. Okay, awesome. So how, how do you guys... Uh, charge clients in the sense like do they do they pay by uh, is it cash in hand or is it all online how is it um so depending on the phases that you're in we uh phase so pre-academy and game development is all monthly depending on number of sessions so say for example there's four sessions in the month um it's eight pounds a month it's eight pounds per session so that's 32 pounds pay in advance but if you can't if you know you can't attend a session that month let us know and deduct eight pounds. Okay. So that shows that we're not having a set fee. We're not trying to take money off them. We're being fair and honest to them. Mm -hmm. But if they tell us within 24 hours they can't attend a session, they don't get any money back. Okay. If it's a medical emergency or anything like that, we then roll it over. So we're just being a fair company. We're not trying to take people's money and people respect that a lot. Mm -hmm. If it's phase three, which is PDP, because it has a lot more benefits in it and a lot more, uh, many more perks in it because players are getting a lot more out of it. It's a subscription fee um, or a, you know, installments. So you can pay over time. But if you pay an installment, say, if you pay a year, you're saving about £100. If you're okay. just paying two installments, you're paying 50 quid. So it depends on which phase they're on because the, I think the older they are or the more um, detailed or more focused the program is, um, the more commitment you need be, to be, for them to get more out of it. That makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. So something we we uh, teach our coaches mm -hmm. in, our, in our program to do mm -hmm. is to try and shift away from the the, the cash in hand. Yeah. Just because it's 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 unpredictable what you're going to be earning each month, and yeah. also you allow the client a little bit more control of your business. Yes. So correct. when you started, did you start cash in hand? And did yeah. you make a transition or how did that work? So during the pandemic, when we were doing fields, it was just cash in hand, um, just because we were a small business. Most of it, my bank transfer, basically. Um, mm. And I, I just had it in my account as a sole trader. Uh, I did all my tax returns and everything like that. I just kept doing it like that. But as soon as we went into paying for pitches and, you know, paying for more things, that's when we just got a lot stricter. We just went all online. Now, the other thing that we do now is for one-to-ones, we don't just accept one-off bookings. Very rarely do we accept one-off bookings because we feel like, what is the point of someone coming for one session and then never coming again? You're never going to learn anything. You're not going to learn much. So what we do now is for our one-to-ones is you have to, um, we do it in six-week blocks. Okay. So what I do is uh, every six weeks or probably like the week before we go into a new block is I send all the dates out to the, all the clients I had bookings with us the previous slot mm -hmm. the previous block because i want those ones because i want to keep helping those ones i want them to get to the level that they're happy with so for example i would be like right thursday the fifth thursday the you know 12 blah 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 blah. right what times do you want they send it back okay they booked five sessions out of the six weeks okay right this is how much it is and they just pay all up front i usually offer them a you know 20 pound discount on it mm -hmm. it's good for me because i know they're coming it's good for them because they've got it in their diary they can plan their time around it and I would probably tell you, uh, to be honest with you, within about an hour of sending all them block, those sessions out in that block were booked up. Yeah. And that's with three or four coaches. Yeah. Very, and then if we have any dropouts, um, because they're regulars, I'm usually quite nice. I'm like, yeah, no worries. We'll just move on to the next block. I just put it on Instagram and it's gone in 10 minutes for a last uh, cancellation. Um, and that's how we do it because we want to be working with the same players. So a little thing that I need to, a little saying that I need to explain to players or parents who are inquiring is we're hard to get in with, but once we're in, we're loyal to you. We'll always put you first. And that's what we say. Yeah. Love that. Love that. That's awesome. Cool. So you that have been, you know, you're, you're, you're currently in the game, shall we say, uh, you've yep. got your business going. Uh, where do you see private coaching going in the UK in the next three to five years? Um, I think, first of all, there's too many teams in this country. 
So there's too many teams. Um, there's a massive demand. There's demand for players, but I think there is not enough additional training out there. Private training is the way forward because the standard of the game is going up all the time. Now we specialise in women's. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say 60% of our clientele are female players. Now you probably know where the game's going for the women's game. Mm-hmm. The standard of it is going up and up. Yeah. Um, girls want to get better than boys. You know, they're pushing each other. Um, and that's where we're massively growing. Mm-hmm. For the next four or five years, I think it's going to continue going up. But I think those coaches who are trying to do it individually by their own name are not going to be successful because they're not going to be able to scale to a... They, they'll still be successful. Don't get me wrong. They'll still get clients. They'll still get... But I think in order to be able to make passive income or make it a really good business model, mm-hmm. they have to make it a brand. They have to make it something that other coaches can relate to. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why we've been successful because I've never tried to change a coach's personality or a coach's way I've only just said you need to follow these, these, these few things. And if you follow these things and your session's based around it, I'm happy. Because at the end of the day, the player's coming back because of you, not me. Yeah. Um, and that's the only advice I'll probably give to, you know, anybody thinking about a coaching company is don't make it about you. Make it as a brand. Make it a brand, yeah. 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 Awesome. I like that. So if there's a coach out there in, in the UK that, that is watching this, this yeah. uh, this this video this interview <laughs> yeah. and he's currently doing it part time yeah but has that hunger that desire to do it full time what's what's a few things that you can you can recommend to him or her um engage with other businesses um we 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 um so daytime stuff uh one of my 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 other main coach, if you want to say my second command, he he, just, he does he's not he doesn't have any um you know percentage in the company or anything. I just call him my next next time. He has his own he has his own business in education. So um, he talk his uh, PE programs, after school programs, um you know scholarship programs, all that kind of stuff. We we play a part in that. So that's how we do it full time. So we have that daytime covered. You know, I think. If you want to grow your evening stuff, mm-hmm. you need to try and get into a couple of schools. Even if it's after school clubs, even if it's a breakfast club or a lunchtime club, if you can get in there, you've got an opportunity of getting 20, 30 kids who want to play football. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where you can start making it full time because then you just start making, there's not much money in the daytime, but if you go into a school that's five or ten kids that could be coming to your evening stuff and that's when you can make your money. So I think you have to start thinking about how can I use my daytime to pay for my evenings, to make more money in the evenings rather than thinking how can I make money in the day. Mm-hmm. So we think about how do we use the daytime to make more money in the evening. Yeah. Okay. Where do we find the clients? Where do we find the players? Where do we find the, the people that talk about us? Mm-hmm. Yeah, love that, love that, awesome. All right, Joe, let's take you back to 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 the start then. So when you okay. first started, um, yep. talk to us a bit about how you got your first client. My first client, um, so um, I guess just growing up, and you know, you know, friends knew about me and my playing career, and you know what I was doing. And I think what I did was I just, um, you know, I just told my parents my parents knew a few kids or I knew a few you know friends who had kids and I was like you know do you, do you want to come along for a session like you know especially I think the opportunity was perfect because it was locked down there was nothing there wasn't much to do mm-hmm. and, and I got a client come down I was charging I think it was 15 quid like I was thinking like wage like I was like how much do I get paid on my job I get paid 15,000 an hour let's just charge that um, and I literally started with a bag of balls and some cones um, and you know I just put them through a couple of, uh, you know, an hour session and I was like, do you want to do it again next week? They're like, yeah, no, no worries. Did it a couple of times. I was like, hey, can I just take a photo with him? Is it okay? Can I post it on Facebook? I made a Facebook page. Like, Is it okay if you share it? Um, can you? And then they'd be like, oh, I've got a friend who's interested. I went, oh, yeah, just pass my number. Mm-hmm. Um, and it grew, you know, and then when I got five clients um, and then they were telling people and then, 
you know, because I think I, I was kind of, I had a few 15 year olds, 16 year olds who were at academies. Um, so they were looking and, and you know what, that age, they're big, they like social media. Yeah. So I needed to get a tripod, film a couple of the drills and things like that. And then I'd share it on Instagram and they were like buzzing because they like to share it and their friends and then their friends were like, you know, oh, what's that? So they need to come down. Mm-hmm. Um, any money that I made, I just bought more and more equipment, more and more equipment, more and more equipment. Um, and, you know, I grew it and grew it. And it was organic growth. Like I didn't really... Um, I didn't really like doing any Facebook boosts or those social media stuff. It was just organic growth. If you can get people talking, people will talk. Like, you don't realise what parents, like when parents meet up, they do actually talk about what the kids are doing, like what, what clubs they're going to and things like that. Um, and I think that's been one of our strengths as well. It's just been organic growth. Like we've not tried to put like massive ads out there. Um, mm-hmm. But what I tell people is like, it's taken two years for us to get here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and... I think, I don't think it really started from just that first client. It started when I was 18, when I went to university and got my sports coaching degree. When I got my level two, when I started playing football, building up a bit of a profile about me, that all led up to me getting my first client. Like, it's not just going to come down just to pe- making a post or making an Instagram account. Like, I think since I was 18, it's all kind of like knocked on effect to each other to then get that first client. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so how many uh, how many clients are you currently working with at your your academy at right now? How many do you have in uh, total active? In total active, two hundred and fifty. Uh, wow. I think, and then I think September is going to go up to 300, 350. Um, awesome. I think we do camps as well. Camps of between sixty and eighty players. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the clients differentiate, you know, we just get clients who just come and do uh, camps. We have clients who just do one-to-ones. We have clients who do, you know, the different phases. Um, yeah, so and it's, it's growing all the time. And I think, I think, we're, I think that the reason why we're growing is we're always willing to adapt. We're always willing to take on feedback. You know, I'm always constantly asking parents, like, is there anything you'd do better? I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. Is there anything you'd like? Okay, right, let me see. Um and, you know, we're just trying to meet the demand all the time. We're not really trying to think about five years' time. We're just thinking about next week, next month, like, what, what can we do better for these players next year? What can we do better for these? Well, we're thinking, right, I need, I need in five years' time, I need this, I need this, I need that. Um, we're, we're just taking it uh, step by step, really. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I, I would never have thought we could have gone from one player to 250 players in two and a half years. That's awesome. Awesome. Congrats, congrats. So... When a player joins your joins your yep. academy, joins your your company, what's the what's the journey they take? So they join with you, and what's the what's the end result you're looking to achieve with that player? Um, okay, so I'll give you two different scenarios. We might have a player who's completely novice to football, so they would go into our pre academy, just and you know that might just get them ready before they join a grassroots team. Um, our idea picture is that they stay alongside us and go into the game development program just to keep constantly building that confidence and that knowledge and understanding of the game um, and you know they return to their club whenever they feel like they're ready I think I think, I think a good thing to say is we're not expecting players to stay with us forever our success is if a player comes to us say for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months and then turns around saying or their parents turn around going hey he, he, he's learned he's learned a few skills he's got a load of more confident you know he, he wants to go back and just focus on his club that's success for us we've had that kid take a couple of steps um, on the other hand you might get a 12 year old who comes to us who goes hey he's lacking a little bit in his technical element of stuff um, can he come and train with you guys for a bit you know just to catch up with maybe the others in his group we'll be like right yeah no worries come to our game development session this allows us to analyse him they have a free taste session there just to see what he's like, whether he has the right mentality or the right social skills. If he has those kind of like right attributes, then we would let him come to a PDP because that is like elite training mindset. Um, because we wouldn't want to put a kid who's, you know, maybe doesn't like losing, uh, maybe has a struggle with handling losing or has, you know, not that mental strength. We wouldn't put him in there because that is a real elite environment. So we just want to make sure. Um, 
say he excels in those and he really wants to learn, he really has that elite mindset, he'll go into PDP. That's a minimum of three months commitment. Mm-hmm. Um, what we're finding now is players are just staying on. They're just staying on year after year. They don't want to seem to leave that. Um, and the idea is they just, ideally, for me, I just want them to become a better person. Mm-hmm. Um, I measure success on small steps. So, for example, I saw a 14-year-old the other week out in public. He came over and shook my hand. I, I didn't go to him. He came to me. That's success. That means he respects me as a coach. He respects me as a person. Um, are they having success in education in their school? Are they having success in their grassroots teams? Um, we're not bothered about whether they make it academy or not because we know what the percentage is and they know it as well. If they just want to get better, we're happy with that and we'll help them do that. Um, the perfect idea is, and it'll probably be, it'll only happen once or twice if we're lucky, is that a player signs, signs up with us at five, stays with us throughout the whole five phrases and signs a professional contract. Yeah. That's that, but that'll, We know that will only happen maybe once if we're lucky. Um, but that's the reason why we have the five phases. Because it mm. could happen, like that it, it could happen. Yeah. Um, and phase five, which is the uh, scholarship program, that's mm. that's a new thing we're trying to create because we've noticed that we're getting players who are fifteen and they're you know they're not knowing what to do next, and they keep asking us if we're having teams or not. And we're like no, but at sixteen we don't really have any teams, so you know we want to kind of carry on the pathway. You know we don't want to end our work with. Them. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just that's just, that's just that's that's our probably our idea. That's probably a good explanation of like how we do things. Right? Awesome. So, how many coaches do you currently have? Eight. So, eight. yeah, eight coaches. So, five elite technical coaches. They help run PDP and one to ones. We then have three coaches who run game development and pre academy. So they have they're more you know game orientated. You know, like the small sided drills. They like, you know, possession, kind of that, you know, spits their personality more. Um, they're maybe the more modern day coach. Uh, whereas the elite technical coaches are, they like the one-to-ones. They like that, you know, the attention to detail on players individually. Um, so that's what we have. And, you know, they all have their own jobs. Um, but I think by September, we'll be, we'll be able to make one or two full time, which will be massive for us because it allow us to go into um, other revenues. But yeah, that's what we've got. We've got eight, eight. And then what we do is we have anyone who turns 15, mm-hmm. we offer them the opportunity to be assistant coaches. Mm-hmm. So they can be assistant coaches in our camps, in our one-to-ones. Um, you know, they, they don't get paid for evening stuff, but we, I give them, you know, 20 quid if they help out on camps, you know, just to give them a bit of motivation. Um, and, you know, that's really useful, actually, because they kind of know what's going to happen. They kind of know what drills it's going to be. So they, they really do help, especially with demos. And it's, again, it's just getting that cycle going. Like, can you keep these people in? Can you keep giving them opportunities? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that actually brings me on to my next question is, how have you found or what tips can you give to coaches that have currently staff on how to manage and deal with, with the obstacles or the challenges that come with dealing with and managing people? Um, uh, it's a good example actually because um, this morning um, the, one of the female coaches who leads the girls game development sessions she's um, she's a student but she plays a high level of football she's in level 2 so she's been leading that now for about a year she messaged me this morning just saying um, hey I'm really sorry but I'm not going to be able to do weeks, uh, weekly sessions anymore um, just due to my placement that I've got because she's trying to become a school teacher and I said hey no worries you know I completely understand and I think that's the number one thing you need to realise when you're running a business that people have lives outside of football. You have to respect that. You know, there's other commitments. And because I have that respect with all my coaches, they all let me know in advance. They all, you know, they all tell me if they can't do something and I'm really cool with it, you know. Like, at the end of the day, if they can't do it, I'll just do it. Like, I'm not going to get upset about it. Um, so anyway, yeah, she said that. So then I, my next, so the challenge was, right, she's going, like, who's going to replace it? Who's going to lead it? Luckily, I've already got two coaches who've been assisting her, who have done one, a couple of sessions on their own. So I was like, right, yeah, that's fine. They'll, they'll be completely fine on their own. I trust them. I've seen them do it. I've analysed them. I've watched them. But let's just put a, a safety barrier in just to make sure they're ready for it. So one of my um, other game development coaches from another venue is going to be supporting them for two, three weeks. 
just to make sure that they are delivering to the standard, making sure it's right, giving any feedback or if they need to change anything. After two or three weeks, if they're happy with it, we will then let them to run it. I would then get a 15-year-old into becoming an assisting second-in-command coach. And again, it's just keeping the cycle going. Um, so I would say if you have staff, the three tips I'll give you is understand that they have lives outside of football. Respect mm-hmm. that. Uh, number two, trust them. Like the last thing a coach wants is constant messages from their boss checking, are you okay for it? Are you doing it? Like I don't message any of my coaches double checking. Like I know they'll message me if they can't make it. Um, And then I think the last one is um, try and build a team that has similar personalities. Mm -hmm. Um, Try to, you know, keep it like a small team. Um, Try not to have any... We've had a coach before who was an an amazing coach, but his ego was a bit too much. He... um, um, I think he was, was, um, you know... Billy big bollocks sometimes, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think after, I think it was after six months, I just said to him, I said, hey, you know, I think your time's come to an end with us. I think you, you, you think you're a bit bigger than us, um, you know, and I just want to wish you all the best, but I think your time's come. And he was completely fine with it. He went, yeah, no, no worries. You know, I want to be going and, you know, trying to get into academy football. So again, just be brave and don't be honest. Like, just, you have to remember that they are they are uh, representing you. You have to, you know, keep them in line, but you also need to have that balance of, you know, there are, they are people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. That's really, so, some really good advice there. And h- how do you build that trust though? Cause I think that's, that's a lot like when you're the leader of a program or a company, it's, it's very difficult to trust other people the same way like you trust yourself with the business. How do you build um, that trust? Um, I would say, well, you know, no one does a session on their own when they first join. You know, we supervise them for three or four weeks. So we can see what the standard is. Um, there's always a lead coach that I trust that would always be on the same venue. So they'll be like, you know, they'll be able to look over the shoulder and just make sure everything's okay over there. Um, we have a a code of conduct for our parents and that code of conduct number one states that if you're not happy with anything speak to the head coach not that coach so parents know they can be 100% transparent but if they see anything wrong they just tell us uh, we never had the case but I think having that barrier and letting parents know that they can come and contact me straight away kind of makes the coach stand on his toes maybe a little bit and be like right he's got spies kind of essential not really thinking he's got spies but there are people watching you know there are people who will and I have parents who you know you do get parents who like to talk put it that way um so i think you know knowing that um i, I think i think that, i think the important one is i think that what well, the reason why i've been successful is i've always had hunted by coaches mm-hmm. so i've always gone after coaches that i've wanted i've mm-hmm. never really publicly advertised it um i've always done it word of mouth so for example i might hate you know any coaches like you know we're looking for one here and then one of my coaches would be like, oh, yeah, this is guy I coached him a couple of years ago. He's really good. You know, we should bring him on board. So, and that kind of puts a bit of faith in it. So, I'm kind of taking the trust from the people I already have trust in to put trust in a new person. Um, and I think that's why it's been successful because we've kind of built it together as well. Because I'm always asking for the advice of those coaches that we have. And I think that kind of builds that mutual trust for each other because I trust in their decisions. And because I'm taking their opinion on things, they trust me because they know that I, you know, I'm, I'm asking for them for their advice. They're going to trust me in what we're trying to create, basically. Cool. Love that. Love that. Awesome. So, last question for you. Where do you see your business in the next five years? Um, we, we, we have one goal. Um, well, we have two goals. Number one is that we want to be the, the, the number one training edition provider in Yorkshire. Um, we don't want to scale too big. We want to scale to a size that we can produce the quality week in, week out. Um, number two, we want to have our own warehouse. We want to have an indoor facility with an indoor pitch where we can do sessions for our the whole week we can do it in the day we can do it at weekends we can host matches we can 
we can you know rent out to partner clubs you know a real training facility um for these players to come and train you know for example you know i would love it if i could have a pro come in we we we, we help pros in pre-season but you know pros come in having a private session in, in our gym and then they do their own stuff and then they can have a technical session with one of our coaches um and we really want to create an environment where players are coming to improve and develop but that is the that is the aim that we want to warehouse here cool good love that and uh well good luck with that um I can tell from the your you know your your hunger your desire that I'm sure I'm sure you you'll get there. So we, we hope we hope we hope. <laughs> awesome. So for any coach watching that might want to get in contact with you or follow like your you know your academy your business's journey, how what's the best way to find you? Uh, you just find us on uh, Instagram. It's um, YP Academy uh, underline. Um, you know, you find us on there, we're really accessible, you know, we reply to DMs all the time. Um, there's a personal email there as well. If you want to message me for any information, you know, we help coach that all the time. Um, you know, if you're nearby, you, you know, we let coaches come and watch us um, or we can go and help them. Um, and I, th I, th I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good, important advice to give us. Um, don't be afraid to copy anyone. You know, take someone's idea and then implement it in your own way. Um, football is a game of opinions. So people are not going to like some of the stuff you do. People are going to love some of the stuff you do. And uh, and again, that's why we're we're so respectful to anyone, you know, because we know it's a game of opinions. And I think that's one of the, I think that, I think that's a really good tip to leave uh, to leave it on is football's a game of opinions. So don't shy away from what you think is doing right because someone else would probably think it's wrong. But you know, we're, we're, it does all make sense. Like you know, everyone's going to think you know that's I think that's why we've been successful because we've always respected opinions. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to leave, someone leaves, we're happy with that. Someone wants to join us, someone wants to join us. You know, it's at the end of the day, it's a business and it's an opinions. Yeah, awesome. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Joe, for your time. No worries. Uh, thank you very much. I've definitely learned a lot from you and I'm sure our viewers will as well. So all the, all the best and hope to, to connect again. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching this interview. Again, if you want to connect with Leo, if you live in the UK and you're thinking about starting or growing your own training company, there's a link right below this video in the description. You click on that and that will take you to a page where you can book a Zoom call with Leo. Thanks so much for watching today and uh, we'll see you on the next interview.